Many players, including myself for many years, feel put off or alienated by JRPGs by arguably their most defining aspect, turn-based combat. There have been many occasions in which I have encountered the sentiment that turn-based combat is boring and ruins otherwise slick, fun and exciting games. And though I believe a slight bit more open-mindedness to the games one plays is necessary, I can understand how the player who grew up with the immediate respawns of multiplayer Call of Duty or the perfect timings required for Smash fights would have a hard time adjusting to the slow, tactic-heavy nature of a good turn-based combat system. Due to this general trend of faster paced games and the fact that technology is starting to catch up with developers insatiable appetite for faster, flashier and more fiddly action combat systems, games have been trending more and more towards action, with even some JRPG titans such as Final Fantasy flirting with ditching the old for the new in the questionable 15th installment of the series. Yes. The game once known as Final Fantasy vs 13, and I am still bitter about that one, was Square Enix's final push to make Final Fantasy fully action based. Until it wasn't. Although Square's mission statement with FF15 was to create a Final Fantasy for fans and first timers alike, their oversimplification of the game's combat made that mission a hell of a lot harder to achieve. To long-time fans of the series, 15's combat felt extremely generic. It seemed to them as though the effort to appeal to new fans led to a loss of identity for the combat system. Many complained that it was a one-button-to-win system that required little to none of the strategy usual for JRPGs. And new fans? Well, aside from the attempt to dumb down the combat, FF15 was an incredibly rushed and messy experience, putting many prospective fans off, and those that could see past this were presented with a bastardised version of what a Final Fantasy should be, from combat, structure and story. I promise this video is not just a rant about my personal disappointment with Final Fantasy XV, I am getting to a point. After this blunder, the course needed correction for the FF team's next project, the hype to all hell Final Fantasy VII Remake. In direct contrast to the disappointment that was FF15, the original Final Fantasy VII is the darling of pretty much all fans of the series. Many players had their first experience with Final Fantasy, wait, no, scrap that, JRPGs as a genre through FF7 due to an unprecedented marketing campaign aided by Sony who were desperate for a big exclusive for their still new PlayStation console. Despite this extreme hype at the time and now over two decades of praise lumped onto it, Final Fantasy VII is genuinely an incredible game underneath it all, with an engaging plot, interesting characters and a finely tuned turn-based combat system. Final Fantasy VII employs the series staple active time battle system, first introduced in FF4. Designed by Hiroyuki Ito, one of the Final Fantasy series most influential production staff, the ATB system is basically a traditional turn-based combat system with a timer imposed onto it. A bar fills from the beginning of a battle or after the previous attack for each character and as soon as said bar has filled, the player, party member or enemy can attack, use an item or cast a spell and all actions are blocked until one has a full bar. The ATB system was such a hit with players due to its re-injection of urgency into turn-based combat by putting not only the player but the whole battlefield on a real-time clock Battles become just as much about timing and quick thinking than they are about thinking ahead and strategizing. On top of this system then typical for the franchise, Final Fantasy VII adds the Materia system, an item based ability system which allows for deep customization as all characters can be equipped with any materia, regardless of stats or skill affinity. These two systems combined result in an incredibly deep and malleable combat apparatus for a prospective player to dive into 
and is a major reason for Final Fantasy VII's everlasting success and influence. So when the developers at Square Enix sat down to rethink and remake their magnum opus, questions of truthfulness to the original and of modernization were raised immediately. They understood the sensitivity of their task. How do you keep the fans of the original satisfied whilst updating everything to a modern standard? Well, let's take a look at their eventual answer. The Final Fantasy VII Remake landed with a thunderous roar in my living room. It being early in the pandemic, my only responsibility at the time was to check up on my Animal Crossing village. So when the 10th of April hit, I was chomping at the bit to steam train into a Midgar unlike one I had experienced up until then. Of course, I was ecstatically awaiting a reintroduction to some of my favourite characters in video game history, and to revisit some of the most memorable locations of my gaming career. But as the new game shininess had started to dissipate, I surprisingly was not left with an empty, sinking feeling like most overhyped AAA RPGs released recently. Cough. Cyberpunk 2077. Cough. No, instead the hours were winding by, and with every one that wound, I found myself becoming more invested and engaged by the gameplay, which in all honesty I thought would be the game's weakest element. You see, as previously mentioned, I had been burnt before by Square Enix's insistence on moving Final Fantasy out of its traditional combat style and into an action context. But unlike with previous efforts, the devs didn't seem to be throwing out the old for the new, seeing as a project such as this could be the perfect bridge between modern and traditional Final Fantasy, and could also finally make good on a promise of a Final Fantasy for fans and first-timers alike, the decision to meld the two combat styles seemed like not only the most obvious approach to take, but also the one with the most potential to further achieve the goals set out by the original to create an action-packed, epically proportioned role-playing experience. So, what did this Frankenstein of a combat system actually look like? Fights in Final Fantasy VII Remake are a feast for the eyes, with all manner of particle effects, characters and enemies darting all over the battlefield, and finally a decent camera for an action Final Fantasy game. The kinetic energy of the fights can be felt tenfold when playing, with the player's first task in combat being to attack enemies in real time with the square button, inflicting damage and with every hit, raising the ATB gauge in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Like the original, each character in one's party has an ATB gauge that will fill up as attacks are landed. The player can choose at any moment in combat which of his party to control directly, with the other party members being controlled by an AI that does a decent job of raising the ATB gauge, getting in some good hits, and keeping the characters out of harm's way. But once those ATB gauges are full, the player can go into the Tactics and Abilities menu with the press of the X button. In this mode, time is slowed to a crawl, to allow the player to survey the battlefield and navigate the menus to find the ability, spell or item they want to use, and they can select these options for any party member that has at least one full ATB bar, even if that character is not being directly controlled. Once an option has been selected, the fight resumes and the player's choices play out in real time. This method of incorporating the excitement visual flair and skill of a character action game with the strategy and forethought of a turn-based system ostensibly allows the devs and players to have their cake and eat it too. It not only allows for a wider range of playstyles, with one hypothetical player choosing to engage further with the action side of the combat and only occasionally stopping to use the menus, and another playing the game closer to a traditional JRPG. But most players, I think, played as the developers intended, with a good mix of the two systems, for this is when the game feels at its most visceral and exciting. Watching Cloud rip through a group of Shinra troops in slow motion as one chooses an option in the menu, 
and then seeing time speed back up and the devastating result of one's actions is truly mesmerizing. This new and improved action ATB system feels incredibly satisfying to play and is a direct continuation of the design concept of the original ATB system to demand not only strategy in combat, but quick thinking as well. All of this is matched with a virtually unchanged materia system, leaving the remake playing like the game you falsely remember to be the Final Fantasy VII of your childhood. Let's take a closer look at the menu system, more specifically the abilities tab. In the original FF7, the first three options of the battle menu were attack, spell and item. But in the remake, the attack option is left futile by the introduction of the real-time combat. The devs understood, however, that a menu for only spells and items would be utilized by only a small selection of the player base and would be all but useless to players mainly focused on physical attacks. So some more creative adaptation had to be employed. The solution eventually decided on was to take certain limit breaks of each character and rework them into standard abilities that can be performed for the cost of one or two ATB bars, such as Cloud's Braver and Omni Slash, or Barrett's Big Shot. Other limit breaks from the original were left as just that, limit breaks. Special hard-hitting attacks that have their own bar to fill before they can be performed. In the original, limit breaks were like regular attacks, determined by a time-sensitive bar that simply fills as the fight goes on. In the remake, the bar is filled when the player takes damage or staggers an enemy, with the former giving struggling players a leg up in tough fights, and the latter giving more skilled players a more specific goal to work towards in combat. The stagger system itself is an intriguing addition. In 97's FF7, similar to many turn-based RPGs, a light elemental weakness system was employed, in which many enemies had a hidden weakness to certain spell types, and when that weakness is exploited, the move will hit harder than other spell types or regular attacks. Mind you, there was no staggering or extra benefits to hitting a weakness over not in the original, apart from the damage boost for that move. In 2020's FF7, these elemental weaknesses were extrapolated and absorbed by the new stagger system. Basically, when one staggers an enemy, they become incapacitated. They're unable to attack you or block your incoming attacks, and those attacks that do land damage the enemy up to 1.6 times more than usual. Staggering an enemy can be achieved through either hitting their elemental weaknesses, as previously mentioned, or by hitting the enemy with a good combo, or an ability that has extra staggering power. Staggering can really turn a fight around, and allows players to regain their composure whilst adding an extra layer of thinking for those players planning a few steps ahead. The adaptation of Final Fantasy VII's combat system into the remakes is an incredible study in gameplay modernization. Tetsuya Nomura, director of the remake, and his team felt it necessary to not simply copy and paste the original 7's or 15's combat system into the remake, due to the understanding that this game would be a true bridge for the gap between traditional and modern Final Fantasy. Knowing what these devs chose to keep, remove or expand can give us a better understanding of their intentions as designers. For instance, the reallocation of the attack command to a face button from the action menu is a clear indication that although the game wants you to plan ahead and strategize, it certainly doesn't want you umming and ahhing over the basic attacks, and it wants to keep players on their toes. The fact that attacks selected from the action menu can still be interrupted and cancelled whilst their animation plays out is evidence of this. The balancing act of these two design disciplines is one of the most fascinating aspects of FF7R as a cultural relic, and serves to add to the complex meta-narrative weaved through its plot, marketing, and overall rollout. When playing the remake, you can feel both the old and new almost perfectly synergized, with only slight breaks in immersion due to dodgy NPC models and stiff lines of voice acting but almost never in gameplay. 
I believe that the modernization and expansion of Final Fantasy VII's combat system is an almost perfect example of how to adapt gameplay from one game to another. Satisfying contemporary players while still keeping the feel and spirit of the original, ironing out any kinks it had, and recontextualizing the entire piece through the lens of modern trends and sensibilities. In the next one, part two of this video, we'll take a look at a less successful case of combat adaptation with Persona 5 Strikers. We'll be looking at the decisions made by the devs of that game in adapting the fast-paced, kinetic feel of the original Persona 5's combat system into an action slash musou context and comparing that to Final Fantasy VII Remake's approach. If that sounds interesting to you, please subscribe and turn on notifications to be notified when that drops. Thank you for getting this far in the video. If you liked it, please like, comment and subscribe. It really, really, really helps. Thank you and until next time.